Well, there's nothing quite like the sound of chickens in the morning. And even though I'm inside, uh, you might hear some chickens waking up. Actually, they've been up for a while and uh, maybe getting ready to lay some eggs. So we're just gonna enjoy some chicken sounds in the background today. So this week's scripture lesson from the Gospel of Matthew takes us to the seaside towns of Tyre and Sidon, two Mediterranean towns about 20 miles south of modern day Beirut, Lebanon. So that's right in this region here. Here's Beirut on my map. And as we read this story, I want us to be praying, to begin by praying for the people of Beirut, devastated, reeling, and trying to recover from this terrible explosion earlier this month. So would you join with me in prayer, please? Lord, you know the pain and sorrow of your children in Beirut, the trauma, the loss, the deep grief. We pray a blanket of mercy and healing over the city, its people, its buildings, hospitals, businesses, children. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, bring peace and restoration to the city of Beirut. In your strong name we pray. Amen. So in today's passage, we get to see uh, the very human side of Jesus. We also get to see the very human and very racially divided systems into which he was born and in which he was raised. I want you to prepare yourselves because you might be surprised by and even a little angry with Jesus in this passage today. I know that I am every time I read it. So we're in Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 21. Listen now for God's word. Leaving that place, so that place was Gennesaret, which is on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is an inland lake. Uh, remember, Jesus walked on the water on the Sea of Galilee, So, and then they passed to the other side of Gennesaret. So leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So it's quite a walking journey up to the sea, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 22. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him. So we're going to pause there. Canaanite woman. So it's the only time in the whole New Testament that this adjective Canaanite is used. Now it's a word we see all through the Old Testament. And it always, in the Old Testament, means uncouth, uh, pagan, outsider, not one of us. In Mark's gospel story of this account, he describes the woman as Syrophoenician, so Syrian Phoenician. So he just avoids the word Canaanite altogether. So this woman comes up to Jesus crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So let's stop again. In other words, what Jesus is saying is only my people matter, not yours. Yikes. So it's important to note that up to this point in his ministry, Jesus has actually only been teaching to Jews, healing Jewish people, feeding Jewish people, primarily in Jewish communities. Sometimes there might be Gentiles that come in those crowds, but his audience is always Jewish. And so his understanding of his work up to now has been focused on Jews only, the lost sheep of Israel. But listen to what happens here. Verse 25, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Jesus replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. 
What in the world? Jesus calls this woman and her people dogs. Now, this is not a term of endearment for those of you snuggling with your sweet little puppies at home right now on the couch while you're watching church. No, dogs were not pets in the ancient world. They were scavengers. They were dirty. They were dangerous. So why would Jesus say such a thing? Here's where we take a deep breath, we step back, and we look at the systems, the structures that shaped Jesus and his disciples, and, and even this woman. So it's the teachings of their families, of their faith communities, the stories they told one another, the language, the names they used to, to when they were talking about other types of people. It's deeply rooted. So much so that they do and say things that they don't even realize are troublesome or, or hurtful. Today, we use the term microaggressions to describe this kind of behavior. So microaggression is a term used for brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative prejudicial slights and insults toward any group, particularly marginalized groups. So things that don't seem like a big deal to the one saying it, but to be on the receiving end is deeply wounding. So, Ignoring someone because they are different than you are and instead paying attention to people like you. It's a microaggression. Jesus ignored the Canaanite and his disciples encouraged it. He, they even said, send her away. Another microaggression might be saying a word or a phrase that your family or friend group use easily but which diminishes the humanity of certain people, like calling Canaanites dogs, a microaggression. Some might even call like a major aggression. So two things that give me some pause and some grace for Jesus and his humanity right now in this moment. Number one, I think it's indicative what he says is indicative of the systems he grew up in. Not necessarily his heart or his true nature. It's just that in his humanity, he was limited. He was limited by the words given to him by his family and his faith. And living and operating only in that limited system, he hadn't yet seen how hurtful his actions or his inactions and his words could be. Yeah. The second thing that gives me some grace for Jesus is that I've done similar things. I have said things that my family thought were funny or no big deal. But when I say them around someone to whom it actually applies and I see the look on their face and I realize, oh, I can't believe I just said that. That was terribly racist. I've also ignored or just stayed silent when people not like me are asking for help or seem to be struggling. I just kind of don't know what to do. And so I, I can understand what's going on at the very human level in Jesus' interaction right there. So here's where the Holy Spirit blows through and anoints this native woman, for that is what she was. The Canaanites were natives to the land. The Hebrew people were the invaders and the colonizers. So this native woman, whose skin color and language and culture are different than Jesus, she gives Jesus a word. Mm -hmm. Yes, even Jesus needed a sermon to challenge him. This is a quick sermon, one verse. Verse 27, she says, Yes, it is, Lord. Yes, it is right to give me bread. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Ooh, girl. 
Yeah, can you see her eyes? Can you see that she's just fierce and full of fire, full of that Holy Spirit fire? This Holy Spirit fire in this made in the image of God woman of Canaan. Yeah. Verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Her daughter was healed. Another amazing miracle story. But guess what? From this point on in Jesus' ministry, he turns his attention not only to Jews, but also to Gentiles, to all nations, marking a deeper healing, the healing of divisions between the races of people around the world. So here's what I notice. Jesus starts with ignoring, with silence, kind of just focusing only on the lives of Jewish people. Only Jewish lives matter in his, in his worldview and the, and the work that he's doing. And then he comes face to face with a challenge of actually meeting someone his human family and faith have taught him to ignore and to avoid. And he sees her pain. He sees her need face to face. His first response when he's challenged is to defend his position, to frame the narrative so that it places his group above hers. In so doing, um, he calls her and her people dogs. He, he lowers her value and elevates the value of the Jewish people. But then she comes back, challenges him again, and she says in effect, hey, wait a minute. Canaanite lives matter too. Notice she is not saying that Jewish lives don't matter. She's saying, I'm here. Don't ignore me. See me. See my daughter. See our pain. Yes, our skin, our language, our family tree is not the same as yours. And you ignore us and our suffering. You call us names. But don't we matter as much as you in this world? So Jesus could have defended himself again and walked away and gone back to that silent ignore place, that wounding place. It's often what the systems we are raised on shape us to do. What the disciples wanted him to do. Send her away. Let's get out of here. But Jesus doesn't. He realizes there's something bigger going on here, and he begins to shift and move towards a different direction. Jesus chooses to see this woman, chooses to see her pain, and chooses healing for this woman and for the nations of the world. As I consider my own self on that arc of, do I ignore? Do I deflect and defend, or do I work for healing and transformation? I consider the systems and structures of racism in my own life. And I realized I've camped out here a lot in the ignore, stay silent place. Maybe watch from afar. Let someone else deal with it. Just, yeah, send it over there. And I consider comments I've made the jokes, the names my family use to describe people of other races and ethnicities, microaggressions that I inherited, uh, moments <clears throat> I've done or said those hurtful things um, face to face. I think of those times and seen the look in, in people's eyes and felt the tension in the air and I've had to say to myself, oh my gosh, that was racist. That was mean. I need to rethink that. God has been doing a work in my heart, challenging me to move from this side of the ark, the wounding side, toward the healing side, not to defend and deflect and go back to camping out over and ignore and stay silent, but to move toward healing, toward listening, seeing, growing, expanding my vision, my work. 
For years, I've been reading and listening to the voices of people of color, questioning systems and my own part in them, but not taking much action, I'm sad to admit. But in recent months, I've begun participating in the Kitsap Erase Coalition, which stands for Equity, Race, and Community Engagement, meeting people from all over the county and from all kinds of perspectives, who, people who want, and organizations that want to work together for the healing of our community, the healing of racial divisions, of examining the systems, the structures, the ways we operate and live that are actually wounding to many people. It's hard work. It's heart work. And it's work I didn't even know for a long time that I needed to do. Because I, I understood myself as not racist, but I have not ever actively considered whether I am anti-racist. That's a shift for me to take, which calls me to action. So I wonder, where would you put yourself in this arc? I invite you to reflect on that question. Consider where you are at and whether, where God might be challenging you to rethink which people to listen to, actions to take. Uh, are you in the kind of keeping silent, ignoring? Are you defending your position and doubling down? Or are you willing to look at new ways of seeing things and listen to people you've never listened to before and maybe take new action? Maybe it's work that you didn't even know you might need to do. Here's the good news. This was work that Jesus himself didn't set out knowing he needed to do, that the Holy Spirit did. So I'm thankful for that Canaanite woman and her perseverance, who, for that woman who would not go away until she was seen and heard and her family was healed. I am thankful, deeply thankful, for the women and men in our community who persevere, who ask to be heard, to be seen, who long for their families, for our community, for our nations to be healed. May it be so. To the glory of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.